She is open flame. Uh, PG&E is on scene trying to stop that gas leak, but uh, until such time, we're here. We've declared uh, evacuations and checked every building around the perimeter for a one block radius. There's nobody within the distance in a, in a one block radius. Uh, no injuries to report. There were eight workers right near the scene. They're all present and accounted for. No injuries at this time. Still a very active scene. Um, we're hoping that PG&E gets control of the gas leak very soon. Any indications of any other injuries, bystanders? Uh, none to report at this time, which is great news. That's the best news of all. Everyone's saying that the flames have been just relentless. The fire is relentless. It's been the same as it was when it first started. How are fire crews working vigorously to try to get that under control? So at this point, we're trying to protect exposures. We have one interior exterior. We have one fire building. There have been three exposures. Our main objective right now is obviously to keep everyone safe and to not have that fire extend. So what we're doing is calling it sort of a defensive mode, surrounding and drowning until such time that pg &E can stop that leak. Is this bringing up memories of what happened in San Bruno, that pipelines exploding can't get the, can't get the fire out? Uh, I would say it's, it's not quite as dramatic as that. It's pretty dramatic, I will say, but um, we have a good handle on it. Um, it's it's something that we're um, accustomed to doing. We're trained for. Uh, we would like the leak to, to get tamped down, but uh, not not quite as extensive as San Bruno. Um, so you know, there's a lot of work going on in the city, like you know, and uh, so it looks like I would anticipate that the the gas line line was breached by the workers working on the pipeline. Well, any word so on? Long for PG &E to turn off the gas. They're on scene. Uh, it's complicated. There's a lot of piping under the streets and so forth. So they're doing their best. They. I believe they had a pretty good response time. We were here first, but they uh, had, have a good response time. We're working collaboratively with them. And the main thing is, again, we're we're keeping everyone out at, in, in a, at a safe distance, including you, our media friends. Um, we just, you know, we need patience until the, the gas leak gets out, but I'm confident that uh, it'll be contained soon. Uh, as soon as the gas leak is tamped down, we will have it under control. What did you destroy back there? Uh, I believe it's a restaurant. It's 3300 block of Geary, Geary and Parker. Uh, so the main fire building is the corner building, which is a uh, restaurant. What kind of work are they doing at the time? Okay, so I'll answer every question. Just take them one at a time, please. Um, what was the work that was happening? There were workers uh, working in the street uh, installing fiber optic equipment under the underground. Who were the workers? Uh, there, there were workers, private contractors, uh, in, in doing some fiber optic work. What can you tell us about pg &E's plan to turn off gas in situations like this? Uh, you'll have to ask PG&E. Uh, so you guys don't have any sort of cohesive plan, fire department partnering with PG&E in an event like this? So we partner with them all the time. We, we kind of stay in our lane and do what we do, and PG&E has their protocols. Right now we have a, a joint command. Uh, we have our incident commander that's overseeing the fire. We've asked PG&E to join us. We, we have done some exercises, but they're the experts in terms of terminating the leak and, and, and getting to the source of what they need to do. So we, we partner with them, but we leave the experts to, to do their work. Can you back up? I'm sorry. There was a tweet that went out that said, and it was confusing how many people were accounted for, unaccounted for. How is everyone doing? So right now, uh, we were told that there were eight workers in that vicinity doing the fiber optic work underground. All have been accounted for. At this point, uh, I have received a briefing and there's no injuries that have been reported to me at this time and you've been very patient somebody had a question here go ahead uh, you said that there are pro several properties do you know which businesses are in involved in the flames right now i don't but as soon as we get a better handle on containing and controlling the fire we will we know that one is a restaurant and then there are three other nearby exposure buildings as we Hong call them Lounge, that's my understanding is the fire building correct 3300 block and Uh, no injuries have been reported to me at this time. It's a very fluid situation. So we have, you know, medical personnel on scene. Uh, we have not had to use them at this time for either our members or the community, whether they be workers or patrons at the restaurant. What do you think of the intensity of this fire? We're seeing flames shooting up. I mean, I don't even know how high. Behind you. Yeah, I mean, it's intense because it's been going on now for a while. Um, so we're, you know, we're hoping again that PG&E. It's complicated what they have to do. They have to get into the street. Um, and, and, and shut that down and keep their workers safe as well. So it's it's worthy of a third alarm, and that's what it is at this it's point. taking too long to put it out in your firefighting opinion? The sooner the better is, is, what, is my motto. How many agencies are involved, and are you calling for other agencies to come out and help as well? So the fire department has this handled, and the rest of the city is safe too. That's what we do. Uh, we have a third alarm response, so over 100 members out of our 350 that are working today. Uh, we have a lot of different agencies. We have Department of Emergency Management. PD is helpful. 
uh, MTA is helpful. PG&E obviously is huge in this event today. Uh, so we're all working together to make sure everyone stays safe and that we get this under control as soon as we can. What can you tell us about evacuations? Yeah, Anything people need to know? Uh, we've evacuated the entire perimeter uh, of walk each, each side of the street. How difficult is it to put out a fire that started, you know, a gas fire? I mean, until the gas is yeah, we're hiring. That's a great point. Uh, yeah, we, we need. That's why I think we need to, you know, assure everyone that we're gonna. Until they take care of what they need to take care of. Does water work in this situation? Is it just water that you're putting on, or do you really need the power to get turned off? We're applying water, but again, more more than anything, is to contain it to the building of origin and those three exposures. We don't want it to extend any further, and I have confidence that it won't. We've got time for one more question for the chief. What is the timeline on getting the handle on the situation? As soon as PG&E does their job, our job will become much easier. But I want to assure everyone, everyone's working really hard, including PG&E, all of our members. Uh, it is intense. I mean, as you look down, it, it, it's an intense fire. I'm not going to downplay it. But, um, yeah, it'll, it'll be a lot. Our job will be a lot easier when they... When they You're not concerned about anyone being injured at this point? No. I mean, not at this point, because we have a, a good perimeter set up so that no one is in the danger zone, if you will, except for the firefighters and the PG&E workers. But, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're going about this methodically. We've, we've, we've done this many times before. It's, it'll, it'll go out, hopefully, as soon as we can get the PG&E to, to get their work completed. Thank you, everybody. So we're going to have um, another media briefing. We will announce that on our Twitter, which is at SFFDPIO. This is the official media staging all right, you've been watching a live news conference by San Francisco Fire Chief Joanne Hayes-White. Uh, the quick bullet points, the takeaway from that news conference with regard to this explosion and fire, uh, she confirmed that there was excavation work going on and that work tapped into the natural gas line. She said there were workers underground installing fiber optic equipment, that they were private contractors, uh, and that... Um, they tapped into the natural gas line and that triggered the explosion and then this booming fire. The other point she made that was major is that there have been no injuries, though she cautions that is fluid. Uh, medical people are standing by, but she said eight workers, the ones that were involved with this project, the fiber optic equipment installation, they have all been accounted for, eight people all accounted for, no injuries, so more good news there. She confirmed that at the restaurant, Hong Kong Lounge 2, where there were customers inside at the time that this happened, it was lunchtime, uh, they have all gotten out okay, she said, not injured. But as you can see, that building has suffered fire damage. And she also mentioned three others exposed, as in three other buildings that were also exposed to the fire, the flames. And so what they've been focusing their efforts on from the firefighters' perspective is to keep the containment, not go beyond those four buildings. And you can see someone on the stretcher there being taken away, so uh, hopefully not a serious injury uh, there, but we'll see. It's a fluid situation. Uh, another point that she made was that uh, people were asking, how long is it going to take? And I'm glad I have my colleague, I-Team's Dan Noyes, here with us now to talk a little bit about PG&E's responsibility uh, and their protocol in a situation like this, Dan. That is the real question, Chris, and you, you got to it very well. How much longer will it take for PG&E to turn off that gas line? Mm -hmm. Now, this was a big problem in the San Bruno blast back in 2010. Uh, one, they had a hard time finding where to shut it off. Mm -hmm. And then when the workers finally found those shutoffs in the San Bruno gas pipeline, they were jammed. So they couldn't get the gas shut off. And so that's the other question here. Um, why is it taking so long to shut it off? Um, after the 2010 San Bruno gas pipeline explosion, the CPUC really pushed PG&E to put in these remote switches, which um, would let them actually shut it off. from Without the, going to the danger zone. Exactly right, without going there. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, though, it could be that that didn't happen, that there is no remote. And so the workers have to actually go to the scene, go through their diagrams to find out where that shutoff valve is and get to it and, and turn that nozzle. But but in the meantime, this thing just rages. I'm, clearly, the, the fire department is doing a good job of containing the fire, making sure that other buildings don't catch on fire. That's key here. Now, they wouldn't want to actually put foam on these flames because if you knock down the flames and then the gas is still coming, mm -hmm. that presents a huge danger to the risk 
risk of other buildings catching on fire. Mm -hmm. but, but right now, mm -hmm. they have to let that thing burn, if it's burning safely, but most of all, turn off that darn line as soon as possible. It has been about an hour and a half now, Dan. Uh, you mentioned the CPUC's recommendation for the remote shutoff option. Uh, I wonder, you know, to what extent they've done that uh, and which areas and, and what percentage, you know, they have done and how much more is left to go. Those are all good questions. And there are also other questions here about whether the crew here today, whether they called 811 before. Now, that's the system to call before you dig. If someone's going to be digging in an area where there may be these these gas lines, the, these utility lines, they have to call the the, the call PG&E to figure it out. Now, under state law, PG&E has between two and 14 days after an excavator files that request to actually help identify where the lines are. Now, it's important to point out that back in uh, in December of 2018, the PUC really came down hard on PG&E. Uh, they said that they um, violated state law requiring utilities to promptly respond to the excavator's requests to find and mark underground utilities. Mm -hmm. So just a few months ago, the PUC came down hard on PG&E for not responding to requests like this to help mark these lines. And further, they went on to, to say that um, PG&E created records that falsely reported that the company had responded with, with these requests. So not only didn't they respond to the request, they then made false records to try to make it look like they had in fact responded. So clearly PG&E has had a problem with this 811 system and this will just play out in the days and weeks to come. All right, I want to talk a little bit more about PG&E's responsibility in a second, but we are also seeing now uh, Sky 7 spotting crews actively digging into the ground across the street from the fire. Now, what might they be doing? Is that an attempt to get the shut off? I, I would just be speculating at this point, but you can only imagine that perhaps there is a shutoff valve right there across the street. And if that is the case, boy, that, that is an urgent job, isn't it? Yeah. To actually have to dig through the street like that to try to find a valve to shut off this uh, enormous flame. Now, you've shared enlightening information about PG&E's history and um, being, you know, called out for not properly helping with the marking of these pipelines. I'm wondering if there's something with the pipelines themselves that may make them perhaps more susceptible to this. I mean, are these old pipelines in that area of San Francisco? And and if they are old, does that make them more corrodible, more um, puncturable, more susceptible to something like this happening? Dan? All good questions, Kristen. And we, and we would have to know exactly what type of pipe was there. Was it was it a, a foot? Was it two feet? Was it, was it a 36 diameter pipe? We don't know the age of the pipe sitting here right now. But those are all good questions. But clearly, um, most any type of pipe is not going to stand up if an excavator cuts into it like this. You know? Right, that is very yeah. true. And, and, and I just want to point out, though, that, uh, that uh, in December, when the PUC came down on PG&E, it wasn't just a one or two time thing where they failed to respond to these 811 requests. Mm -hmm. They were accused of undercounting tens of thousands of late tickets between the years of 2012 and 2016. So this was a pervasive problem. Mm -hmm. uh, from the PUC. So again, that, that, look at that. Look at that picture there, Kristen. Uh, yeah, it's just but incredible. if they don't respond, shouldn't the project not be able to go on? Oh, it's ex just exactly a delay, right. right? It's, it's a delay, okay. and and the and the company uh, can file late tickets when PG&E fails to carry out the location and marking on time, and so they can come after PG&E after the fact. But they aren't supposed to dig unless you know what's there. Okay, we want to explore more uh, about PG&E in just a moment, but right now I want to let our viewers know that we have reports that fire crews have warned that high voltage wires were compromised and they are advising people to avoid the area. So high voltage wires there on that block compromised, um, and Dan, that could certainly lead to more danger. Absolutely. Uh, again, you just have to you just have to thank our stars at this point that no other buildings have been compromised. That it was just that Hong Kong Lounge Two mm -hmm. that looks to have suffered damage. The other buildings in the area don't appear to have been damaged, but clearly that that is very high on the firefighters' minds right now to keep this contained, to keep the other buildings in the area from uh -huh. uh, from suffering damage. We should mention that we have calls into PG&E. We are waiting for a response. They have not gotten back to us yet, but we will keep 
trying to uh, talk with them about their plan with regard to shutting off this natural gas, which is still um, unabated right now. Now, we also have on the line with us um, a photographer we often use, Brian Carmody. He is at the scene. Are you still there, Brian? Brian, are you still there with us? Yes, I'm here. All right. Can you uh, give us a sense for what you've been seeing for the past half hour? I know you've been watching this unfold. Anything to add to what we've already seen? Hey, Brian. Take me live right now. Hello. Hey, Brian. Yes. Okay. I got you now. We're having some technical issues, which is to be expected in situations like this. Uh, thank you for joining us. You've been at the scene for a while watching the fire and uh, containment efforts unfold. Can you describe to us what the situation is right now? Yeah. So I got here about, uh, about five minutes after this thing started um, and observed uh, just a huge, huge fireball and a building on fire. Um, I could also actually see down the trench that they were using. They were using an excavator to cut in and make a trench to do something with. Uh, I was told by someone from the water department that this is a 12-inch gas main. Uh, they also are saying that the uh, shutoff is very close to where this fire is. So that's why we're starting to see PG&E moving in their own excavators to start uh, digging in the street to try to get to this. I'm hearing jackhammering sounds from around the corner. Um, also, the, the, the building fire is not out. We are starting to get some more really thick black smoke out of the backside of the main fire building, which was the uh, Hong Kong lounge downstairs and a uh, looks like an apartment upstairs. All right. Um, can you talk a little bit more? Okay, so first of all, the fire uh, is not out at that Hong Kong lounge building with the apartment upstairs. That is new information. Um, so that's good to know. We're sorry to hear it. However, that is the situation. Talk to me a little bit more about what you're seeing with regard to their efforts to get to that shutoff. When you say it's close to where the fire is, how close? And that is underground, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So uh, this, this was a trench operation that they were digging, uh, trying to, to get a trench to obviously lay some kind of pipe or something down there. Um, the uh, the fire in the building is actually in the attic of that building, and at one point the fire department pulled their guys off the roof of that building uh, because they're worried they've put so much water onto the roof that they're worried about the roof collapsing. Uh, okay. That makes a lot of sense. So right now, can you talk to us about whether we saw just moments ago someone being put on a stretcher and taken away? Do you see ambulance activity and whether there might be more people who might need medical attention? I do not see anyone injured at all. I saw a lot of uh, the paramedic crews uh, with all their gear ready, you know, standing at the ready. Um, one of the things that's amazing, I was actually the first journalist at the uh, San Bruno fire a few years ago, and this, the sound of this, this obviously is not as big of a fire, but the sound of this uh, gas coming out of the ground is just amazing. It sounds like a really loud revving jet engine. Also, as I was driving here, um, I could actually see this fire from about 35th and Geary Boulevard, which is about 40 blocks away. That just gives you some idea uh, of how this is affecting the neighborhood. That is crazy. I also want to mention that my colleague Dan Noyes is here. Uh, hopefully his mic is up as well. And Dan, um, you feel free to ask any questions of Brian as well. But you mentioned the San Bruno pipeline explosion. We were wondering about that. That raged all night. And then I, you tell me, but I think 38 homes or something were destroyed. Am I right? And there were fatalities. And, um, you know, hopefully this certainly won't go on nearly as long as that. But it's, it's, it's worrisome because it's been an hour and a half or so. So basically the biggest problem is, is that they just can't shut this thing off. Um, and, and I don't know why I, I listened to Dan talk to some of the issues, uh, talk about some of the issues before. Um, the, the Department of, of Water uh, employee told me that the shutoff is like almost right next to where this fire is burning, which is why they can't shut it off that way. Um, it, it being a 12-inch gas main, uh, according to him, um, it's going to take basically, I think they're going to have to dig around to the different spots around this thing and pinch the gas line off 
manually. Um, I'm not sure that there's any way just to turn this off. So, so, Brian, you're actually hearing that the that the shutoff is right at the location from where the gas is coming out now? Yes, Dan, and that is information from someone uh, that I just spoke to very quickly uh, from the water department. Um, as I was getting here, uh, there were, you know, government employees from pretty much every uh, agency uh, from SF that, that are here. Uh, one thing I'd like to talk about a little bit is, is the police department. The police department uh, got here, actually, as what we say, is they on-viewed this. Um, before this was even put out on the fire channels or anything, a couple of officers, one was a female that was on the air, uh, basically saw this thing happen. I don't know if she saw it actually explode, but, but you know, came upon this thing. The police department uh, really did an excellent job of getting a lot of officers here very quickly to get these evacuations made. Got you. And, Brian, I'm curious, though, you know, we're seeing, of course, the flames still going. We're seeing what looks to be a, a perhaps a lot of steam, or is that smoke? My question is, are buildings right next to this in danger? Do you think, do you see any sense of flames actually uh, in other buildings besides above the Hong Kong 2 lounge? Okay, so the Hong Kong 2 is the main fire building. The one that is to the left, which is what we call the Bravo exposure, there is some smoke coming out of uh, a chimney that I'm looking at right now. The problem is, is they can't get in to the fire building because they're worried about the fire building collapsing. So they can't send anybody in there. The actual fire uh, is fairly contained. The gas fire is fairly contained to that pit there as we're seeing it. Um, but the fire is raging through the attics of the main fire building, and there's just not a whole lot they can do. They have to, as you can see, there's a ladder truck putting some water on the top and a couple of ground crews. One of the things you don't see in San Francisco very often is the fire department using deck guns, which is the actual gun, the water uh, implement that is on the top of the fire engine. Um, that's something uh, normally you want to put the fire out from the inside out, and uh, they are just not having the opportunity to get there. And if you look at the main fire building, we can still see uh, quite a bit of smoke mixed with steam. That's They're getting some water on the fire but we're starting to get some more and more smoke coming out of there. So that, that building is not even under control or, or let alone contained yet. Yeah, and we're starting to see some steam coming out of the other building that you talk about, the B building, the Bravo building, on which the firefighters are standing. It looks as though, at least in the shot just a moment ago, that we saw some smoke coming out of an opening in the top of that second building. Uh, clearly, that is a, a huge concern right now to keep this fire from spreading from that original location into that building next door, correct? See, so see there, right there, you see the smoke coming out of the um, out of the chimney there of that second building. I just wonder whether that is a sign right. of some involvement and, of that building as yeah, well. Yeah, and Dan, yeah, that's not a good sign. That means that that fire is starting to move into the attic of that building, and uh, uh, the fire department, uh, you know, the good thing about that is that they can actually get into that attic. So I, I would assume that they've got firefighters inside there pulling the ceilings of that building so that they can see what's going on there. But going back to the big picture question, Kristen, is how much longer will it take PG&E to shut off the gas here? We now have crews digging by hand in the street, according to what Brian tells us, trying to get at that gas main because the valve at which they could shut off the gas is too close to where the flames are coming out. And so now they're having to dig by their hands through a San Francisco street trying to get this fire put out. And right, and time is of the essence because San Francisco firefighters are essentially doing uh, the band-aid thing right now to try to contain it and right. not let it spread. But as uh, you heard Spencer, who was on the air a little bit before you, uh, talking about if the winds, winds should pick up, uh -huh then you could have a rapid spreading and right now it can move from attic to attic uh they're doing their best to prevent that right. but uh but yes any second any minute any hour that this continues um it is worrisome you're increasing the exposure and risk so exactly. dan i do want to ask you um is there a standard a norm or guidance from the cpuc on how quickly you need to be able to contain 
um, a natural gas situation and shut it off. I, and I realize every Why? neighborhood is different, uh, every pipe alignment is different, but right. do they have some sort of guidance? I'm not sure that there's actually a standard, and I, I could do some more research on that, mm -hmm. but I can make some phone calls here. But I would assume that, that you ought to be able to shut off the gas pretty quickly if you see a major explosion like this. And as we discussed earlier, as a result of the 2010 San Bruno gas pipeline explosion, there was this process of the PUC pushing PG&E to install these remote shutoff valves. Mm -hmm. Now clearly that hasn't happened in this area. If you have workers in the street digging through the asphalt trying to get at the pipeline, there is no remote shutoff valve. We can safely assume there is no remote shutoff valve in this case. And so here you have a very precarious situation and workers digging through asphalt trying to get this under control. That's the key thing that has to happen. And, and I, I just really wonder what process that's going, to, uh, that's going underway right now because we're hearing that the valve that they need to get to is right, right next to the, the flames. flames. Right. And so what will those workers do once they get to the, get to the pipe? I don't know, but I'm very worried for their safety as well. Um, obviously, that is probably one of the reasons why this is taking so right. long. they got to come up with a plan that will keep their workers safe. But let's just for a moment talk about where we are at with PG&E. Uh, let's say, you know, as the firefighter, fire chief said, this was a private contractor that was working there. We don't know how much coordination there was or how much information PG&E gave them with regard to the natural gas line that was clearly there. Uh, but regardless... You know, you had the wildfires, you had the culpability in several of the major ones, if not tubs, but still several and several others outstanding right. in which the investigation uh, we expect to come back not very positive in terms of PG&E's role. We have the bankruptcy. Right. Uh, we have this whole debate over what to do with PG&E at this point. Um, where does this leave the utility with one more black eye, one more... A destructive situation on its hands. It just seems as though it's just one thing after another, doesn't it, for PG&E over this, these past uh, days, uh, past weeks as well. Um, and you know that, that there is that criminal probation from the San Bruno gas pipeline explosion. That's what Judge Alsup is overseeing. Mm -hmm. And he is considering whether to take further action against PG&E. They were found guilty of of committing six felonies, safety violations and obstructing justice in the San Bruno gas pipeline. So, and so Judge Alsop is looking at them um, for problems that they had with the wildfires and whether they have not been as forthcoming, whether they have not, uh, they were supposed to inform the court if they were under investigation for any other wildfire. Mm -hmm. Judge Alsop found that they did not inform the court that they were investi under investigation for the Honey Fire in Butte County in, 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 20, in 2017. And so the judge did find just recently, just last week, that they did violate their probation. Mm -hmm. He's holding off sentencing for, for another date. But all that said, um, the, the, uh, the PG&E is being hit on many fronts, yes. civil, criminal, yeah. and this is just, uh, just the latest Yet thing. Another one. Right. All right. Uh, our reporter, Laura Anthony, had been uh, out at the scene. She joins us now with PG&E uh, with more information. Laura. That's right, Kristen. Uh, in fact, I'm standing here with a spokesperson for PG&E. His name is Justin King. Thanks for joining me. Jason, um, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, obviously, still a, a fluid situation. The fire's still burning. Uh, when can you tell us, will the gas be turned off? Right now, we have crews on site working to help make situations safe for first responders. Um, at this time, we do not have an estimated time for shut-in. They are currently trenching so that they can shut off the gas at two different points and get this flow of gas stopped. But in the interim, they've taken steps to help make the situation safe for the first responders on site and for the surrounding community. Initial reports are that it was a third party construction incident that we're responding to. And we'll share additional information as we have it. Third party, now we'd heard from uh, uh, Chief Joe and his wife that it might have been some sort of fiber optic work that was being done underground. Do you have any idea? Not by you, but by a third party, another construction company. Don't know what the nature of the work was, but the reports that I've received are that it is related to a third party construction incident that occurred at the site. Can you tell us about this gas line? How big is it? How, uh, how far underground? We're working right now to determine which line was actually impacted. Crews are excavating at that site to determine the best way to get gas shut off quickly and to make the situation safe. And typically, it's not just a matter of people think, well, why can't they just turn it off, just turn a valve? You can't do that? 
as it is, the quickest way in this situation is to actually trench and squeeze off so that, because otherwise you'll have gas evacuating. So our crews are working fa quickly and safely to make that happen. What kind of communication typically would occur between a third party contractor and PG&E to make sure that something like this doesn't happen? Typically you would have a, a call that would go to the 811 line. Our crews would then go out and mark the site. The information I have is that that did happen, the site was marked, and that there was an incident at the site involving a third party construction crew. Of course you understand that seeing something like this brings back some tough memories for people here in the Bay Area, specifically in San Bruno. What would you tell people about how things are different perhaps than they were then and how things might be safer uh, given what we're seeing here today? You know, our crews are on site, they responded quickly. You know, working with first responders makes the situation safe and they'll get the uh, working to get the gas shut off as quickly as possible. Any time frame for that? We do not have a time frame at this point. Anything else you want to add? That's it. All right, Kristen, so you heard that was Jason King with PG&E. Uh, we'll give you a live look here down the street. We are standing at Cook and Geary. This is about two blocks away, but as you can see, uh, the smoke is a bit heavier and kind of shrouding the flames, but uh, it's clearly still a, a situation that has not been uh, taken care of yet. And as you just heard from PG&E, uh, it could be some time because there's a process that they have to go through to, to cut off gas on both sides sides uh, as as they're saying in a safe manner all right laura thank you so much appreciate that um and dan you heard from uh, the pg e mm -hmm. guy jason king uh laura if you're still with us uh we do want to ask him he said that the crews did go out there their pg e crews went out there and marked the site and you know indicated to the crews that were doing the excavation there's the power natural gas line um so I wonder if he's able, if it's too early to say if they went out there and marked it, um, you know, how did this happen or how were they not aware? Did they make a judging error? Um, is it too early for them to be able to answer that question? Okay, and Jason was kind enough to come back to answer this question. So Kristen Z is asking me, you said your crews got out there ahead of the work and marked the lines, that standard procedure, right? They marked the pavement, that kind of thing. Any indication at this point what happened uh, uh, with those crews that they maybe either didn't heed those markings or anything like that? We can't speculate on what actually happened. Uh, the only solid information I have is that this was uh, initial reports are that this was caused by a third-party construction incident. Okay, Kristen, you heard that. Any other questions for Jason while he's standing there with me? Look, Laura, I am just curious. Uh, so has pg &E installed any of these remote shutoff valves in San Francisco? You know, that they, they were pushed for after San Bruno. All right, Dan Noyes is asking, uh, after San Bruno, uh, PG&E was going to install some remote shutoff valves. Do you know if any of that has been done here in San Francisco? Uh, at this time, we're focused on this current incident, making sure that the situation is safe for first responders. Our crew's working as quickly as safely as possible uh, to get the show, flow of gas shut off. That's all I can really say at this point. Can you say if the flow of gas has been shut off in the surrounding area yet, or should people who are, are business owners and homeowners here, residents, should they be concerned about any sort of uh, gas that uh, might become an incident close by? You know, we want to remind residents if they, if they smell gas, leave their residence or their place of business, um, call 911. Obviously, there are first responders on scene. We're working with them to make the first situation safe and you could probably get information on the evacuation order for the immediate surrounding area from the fire department police PIO. All right, Jason King uh, is with us, Kristen and Dan. If you have any more questions, uh, he's been uh, kind enough to stay here with me. I'm sorry about this process, Laura, but I, I am just curious if he confirmed, and I'm sorry that I came in late on this, I wonder whether he confirmed our earlier reporting that the shutoff valve for that area is too close to the flames to get to, and that's why they're having to dig this trench and pinch off the line. Is that is that the case? Let me ask him that. Okay, Jason, Dan Noyes is asking again. We had some earlier reporting that the shutoff valve for this particular line is too close to the fire, which is why you guys are having to trench out or in, I guess, from a distance to pinch it off that way. I don't have additional information beyond what I shared. I know that our crews are working at that intersection to trench down 
at two different points to be able to squeeze off the flow of gas. But that's the only thing that I have at this point. Typically, how close to, I, I guess, how, how far apart maybe are these turnoff valves? Where would one be typically? Do you know? I don't have information on the circuit in this immediate area. I know that the, the fastest way to respond here was the route that the crews are taking, which is to actually trench and squeeze off. And the flow of gas will stop sooner in an instant using that procedure, and we'll be able to make the situation safe faster. Okay, do you have an ETA on that yet? Do not at this time. Okay, Jason King again from PG&E, Kristen and Dan. Uh, uh, I know again, the uh, fire itself still burning. I know he's hesitant to Go commit ahead. to, you know, he keeps saying, uh, you know, they're trying to do it as quickly as possible and, of course, as safely as possible, which uh, we fully understand. But could you ask him, is this something that could go on till the evening? Um, is it possible it could extend beyond the evening? You know what? He walked away. He's over talking with the uh, fire official. We'll try to get that for you. Um, I don't know. Um, he was saying that it's a process that could take a bit of time, uh, but at this point, I can try to grab the fire assistant chief, I think, who's right here, and see if they can give us any sort of ETA. You want to hold on one second? Sure, yeah, course. please yeah. do. Nothing is more important. Um, okay. You know, folks will be wanting to go home soon, and we're, we're talking about. Here. Right now. We're going to have you guys do media updates at Parker, Parker and Anza Street. We want to get you guys all set up. The smoke going this way, it's not safe for you or me. So for me to take time talking to you, I'm putting you in danger of the smoke. So please um, just kind of follow our orders and go our requests and go up to Parker and Anza and we can get you the information. Do you need a question at ETA? All right. All right. So well, you, you tried. To get us to move out of this area. Well, yeah. Lord, and, and that, They're and trying that to get us to move out of the area because uh, Rick can... Rick can show you. I mean, look down the street here from uh, when I was live here earlier. You can see the smoke is coming this way. Yeah. Uh, we're to yeah. the east of the fire. No, so you need to. they're trying to get uh, all of us and the public to get to a, a location where we're not quite in the line of the smoke. Yes. No, it's, it's a good Safety idea. First. It seems as though the, the wind, go ahead and take off there, Laura. That, that, is, a, that is better for you and the That's crew right. to be safe, obviously. Uh, clearly, the wind yeah. has shifted there. Yep. It looks as though the smoke has come up more. Please, uh, please Laura, t thanks for your time. Thank please you go ahead so and, much. and take off. From that, from that great, point, great information. Um, yeah, the the wind has shifted and it seems as though we're seeing more smoke than before, right. Kristen. Huh? Well, that is also what we were talking about. Spencer was warning that the wind conditions could change in the afternoon, um, and not only does that change the direction of the smoke, but it can certainly also lead to um, the possibility of the fire spreading as well. So Spencer joins us now with another look at the conditions. Yeah. Uh Kristen, the, the very change we were talking about earlier has now occurred. The wind has increased slightly in the last hour, up to about 12 miles per hour. Now, in fact, I have a graphic here. If the, the, if the control room is able to take the graphic full, I can show you. If not, uh, there you go. So the wind is uh, calm in many locations, but here in San Francisco, it's uh, out of the west, northwest at about 12 miles per hour right now. And we have a little animation here to show you what we expect later in the afternoon, about 13 miles per hour, an hour from now. But then after 6 or 7 p.m., we'll see the wind diminishing again, down to about nine miles per hour after 7 p.m. and only about four miles per hour going into the late night hours. So that's uh, barely any any wind speed at all. So we'll get back to current conditions. So right now, as you, as you look at the um, the camera shot of the uh, firefighting, you can see how the smoke is moving in more of a horizontal direction now than it was before. It was moving more vertically before. That's because the wind was lighter. But as soon as the wind picked up a bit, notice how that smoke is going in more horizontal fashion. Uh, but we expect the wind, again, as I said earlier, to diminish in the next few hours. We don't expect it to be a major factor in the firefighting. However, any increase in wind, of course, is a concern, especially for those right there on the scene who are, yeah. who are fighting the fire. And you can see in this wide sky seven shot that the smoke is billowing over several city blocks. Uh, so, Spencer, very much. Now, right now, joining us by phone is uh, someone who has been out there at the scene, a witness to the explosion event. Uh, Julie, are you there? Yes. Uh, first of all, glad you're okay. Can you talk to us about what you witnessed out there and experienced? Yeah, sure. I wasn't that close. I was. I, I have a business on Geary, about two blocks away, and I was inside my store on the phone, and I suddenly heard this. I didn't feel in a, any shaking or an explosion, or, um, but I heard this loud whooshing, roaring kind of a sound, which is kind of hard to describe. But... Um, 
And I kept thinking, what is that? I couldn't figure out what it was. And of course, I hear sirens, but that didn't really get my attention because I always hear lots of sirens on Geary. But then I looked up and I saw all these people in the in the windows looking down Geary with their phones pointing. I thought, uh oh, something's going on. So I went out to the door and stood in the street, and all the merchants, you know, in our oh, right then when that first heard that wishing sound, the power went out. So all my electricity. My computer shut down, mm. and so I went outside, and and all the merchants were out in the street and looking at the big flame. You could see the flames shooting up above the treetops, and kind oh. of flowing south, like onto Geary Boulevard. And um, it was, and then you know sirens were coming from everywhere. PG&E trucks were rolling in, and um, tons of people were. They were blocking off the street, um, so Geary was shut down in both directions. So, and I don't know, I saw a few ambulances, but I don't know if anybody was hurt. Nobody had hurt. Even people who were closer were walking away toward me said they didn't know if anybody was hurt. So, so far, I, we I don't haven't... have reports of injuries, and we hope it yeah. stays that way. Earlier, we saw a right. stretcher, but it turns out it was just equipment being carried on it. So we certainly hope uh, it remains that way. So, Julie, right. I wonder if you had any contact with emergency officials. Have, has there been any kind of an evacuation in your area a couple of blocks um, away? Yeah, there were. I guess they were evacuating people uh, uh, in a, a, the, a block area, but they hadn't started evacuating on my block. Even though the street, they had tape put up, they had police cars so blocking the intersection at. Jo I'm on the corner of Jordan and Geary, and they had the. You know, everything was blocked. They weren't letting anybody turn down Geary. Um, but I didn't talk to any of the uh, responders. Um, but I talked to. Um, other merchants and uh what was i going to say about that but anyway everybody was just kind of waiting to see what was going to happen uh um it was just we were, everybody's just really worried I'm about um if it was going to spread and uh we but we had not been been told to leave yet all right well firefighters so far have been doing a good job of keeping it contained yeah. to those four buildings um can you talk to us about the folks at the Hong Kong Lounge, or I think next to it is another business. Do you know them? Do you, have you talked to them or seen them? Are they okay? No, I don't know them. Okay. Um, and, and I wouldn't recognize them if they were on the street. I wouldn't know who they were. Uh, okay. So I didn't talk to them. So, so, Julie, I'm curious about what's going through your mind. I mean, of course, we have this uh, history in the Bay Area of the San Bruno gas pipeline explosion that was just uh, so horrible and went on for a number of hours and so many homes destroyed, that sort of thing. I just wonder, uh, you being so close to this incident now, what's going through your mind right now? Well, you, you know, I was talking to the guys at Poncho's, that, that um, Mexican restaurant that's on my block, and and we were all kind of felt a little nervous they did shut the gas down i guess i don't notice that because i noticed the electricity but they use gas ranges and stuff so they couldn't cook but it, it makes you worry that the gas could you know that it could expand and you could have more explosions down the line on the gas pipe so we were all talking about that possibility but but we did they did confirm to me that their gas was shut off so um that made me feel a little better, but it is, it's, you know, gas is so scary. It really I is. Just, and, yeah. and we are living in earthquake country, and every yeah. so time you see something like this happen, you think about the potential uh, for lots of natural gas line explosions when we, if and when we do have an earthquake. So we can only hope our utilities, our uh, first responders and everyone is making the proper preparations. Uh, I do want to ask you, because there is a contractor involved, um, apparently the fire department describes and pg &E describes it as a private contractor putting in fiber optic equipment underground. Um, uh -huh. How long have you been seeing or noticing or had you noticed their equipment there? Was it only today that it started? Or? You know, I didn't notice that. Um, you know, I heard that there was a contractor too. I don't. I didn't see that, and and I don't know if that's what happened. I mean, I heard different people saying different things. And one was that something at, at the. I thought at first that it was the restaurant had an explosion because um, you know how restaurants use gas and all that stuff. So, and then I somebody else said that it was from a contractor who was digging. So I didn't notice that, and I had just walked to the mailbox that was a block from there. Um, uh, and didn't see anything, but I wasn't really looking. Uh, you know, just a few minutes before I 
got back and was on the phone and heard the, the whooshing. So I mean, must have just missed it, thank goodness. But um, I didn't notice any trucks. But there's so much construction going on all the time, everywhere. All right. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I pay attention to those kind of things. Right. Julie, yeah. thank you so much for, for your sure. time. Glad you're okay and your business is okay. Yeah. And yeah, we can only you. hope this is wrapped up quickly. We want to uh, talk right now to, by phone, uh, we'll have that in just a mm. moment for you. But I was just going to say, Kristen, that uh, as Julie was talking about, there often are nuggets of truth in the early hours. And, and it turns out that it was correct. It was at the restaurant, not in the restaurant. It was true that it was a third-party construction crew. Mm -hmm. uh, that crew, according to PG&E, had called before, had called that 811 line to get the line marked. So they wouldn't hit it. So it looks as though, at least from what we know at this point, from what PG&E told us, that the utility did do their job. They responded to the 811 call. They marked the gas line for this third-party construction crew, and it looks like they made a mistake at this point um, and cut into that line. From your reporting, I'm wondering if you have any perspective that uh, if it did play out like that, right, that PG&E did respond, did mark the line, uh, could there still be potential for culpability there if it was an accidental you know, mistake done by the part of the contractor? Well, you know, it would be wide speculation at this point to really talk about what PG&E's culpability might be. I mean, but clearly there are a lot of issues uh, here. Uh, there are issues about why it's taking them so long to turn this, this power, to turn the gas off. I mean, actually having this physical process of digging a trench and having some guys uh, use the heavy equipment to pinch the line closed, is, is that really the best that we can do in this modern age? In my mind, it sounds like that will take forever. And every minute is valuable time when you're talking about safety and buildings and, and people. And you're, you're so right, Kristen, and you see those winds changing. You see the smoke going a different way. You see that second building next to the building where the Hong Kong lounge is apparently starting to, so, to show some signs of smoke coming out of the chimney there. Mm -hmm. So I just uh, really hope and pray that no other buildings are involved. Um, the best thing of all, the best news we've heard today is, is that there have been no victims at this point. Yep. And it's just incredible to me that someone is on a backhoe like that, is on that excavator, cuts that line, it catches fire and has that huge explosion. And, and they walk the, away from it. And they walk away from it. Yeah. And, and, but I have to say what Julie said kind of struck a chord with me as well, saying that it's this sound, this whooshing sound, mm -hmm. she said. Mm -hmm. Exactly what we heard in, 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 the, in the San Bruno gas pipeline, right? It was, they said it was like a jet engine. Jet engine. Just that sound of yeah. that gas coming out of the ground and igniting. It is so frightening, followed right. by that 35-foot fireball. And I, I, I tell you that it seems taller to me than 30 or 35 feet, especially when you when you see the wider shot from Sky 7 mm -hmm. showing the level of the buildings nearby. It seems as though it gets, it gets up higher than that. It might. I mean, yeah. those are mostly three-story buildings around there. Right. Uh, so, you know, possibly, but right. it is, you know, it, it does roar to be bigger than that. And right now we have another uh, witness on the line with us, Naomi. Thanks for joining us. No problem. Hi. Can you tell us about your situation? First of all, glad you're okay as well. Did you also hear that roar of the jet engine, that sound when the natural gas was hissing? Did you see the fireball? Did you feel the intensity of the heat? Uh, describe to us your experience. So I actually did not hear the sound. Uh, the reason that I even noticed is that I was at the window entertaining my baby daughter and we saw the cop cars, you know, flying up Geary on the opposite side of the road again. Traffic. So I looked around and there was just a ball of flames up at Parker and Geary and that's when I noticed. So I actually didn't hear any of the explosions. About how far away are you, Naomi, for, from the actual uh, the site of the flames there? I am literally two blocks away. I'm right at Geary and Stanion and our living room overlooks Geary. So right now I'm looking out the window and I can see the flames and all the fire trucks. In fact, equipment. we are... Our, we should let our viewers know this is actually quite incredible. Your video that we're looking at, I assume you were parked there and, and shot this. Um, can you just tell us what went through your mind? I mean, especially if you're with your daughter. Yeah, honestly, I've never seen anything like this before. You know, you always um, have various different fires in the city. I've been here a long time, so I've seen them, but I've never seen flames this high and this intense. And even now, it's still ongoing and there doesn't seem to be any abatement from it, and there's trucks and construction crews digging up the road, so it, it's pretty incredible. Um, I wasn't particularly scared. We're far enough away that it wasn't impactful to our building, but certainly just seeing 
on the cops and fire engines responding was pretty incredible. You know what, I am just curious with the with the size of those flames, could you feel the flame a couple of blocks away or, or, or were you not that close? No, I, I definitely couldn't feel them and being inside, you know, it, through the windows, I didn't feel them. But you can see the fumes and the flames and the, the smoke here, but you, you can't feel the heat. Naomi, how long have you been in San Francisco? So I've been in San Francisco 18 years and living in this neighborhood for 10 years. So this is this is home for us. And I walk up and down the street every day and familiar with Hong Kong Lounge. It's a really busy and popular restaurant with lines out the block on the weekends. And there's businesses on either side. There's a preschool about half a block away. So my first thought was, first of all, was there anyone in the restaurant? And did they get out okay? Because it certainly didn't seem like something that you could escape from very easily if you were inside. Well, we want to let you know that the good news is, according to the fire department, the patrons in the restaurant did all get out, which is fantastic because it was the lunch hour and it was probably packed. Uh, Naomi, this is incredible footage that you shot, and we want to thank you for sharing that with us and also sharing with us your experience. And I'm just curious, Naomi, uh, just, just so I understand your state of mind, I mean, are you feeling comfortable enough at this point in time that you're going to be safe where you are a couple of blocks away? Yes, definitely. I, I'm two blocks away, and at this point in time, I, I feel perfectly safe in our building. Okay, great. Well, we, we really appreciate your time. We appreciate you taking the, that video for us and sending it to us, and, and the best of luck, and please stay safe. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, you know, we talk about what's happened in the city historically, and, and Dan, I think about the Loma Prieta earthquake, mm -hmm. and I think about the Marina District burning, um, the fires. It right. was the natural gas, the you know, feeding the fires and destroy so many homes. And uh, it is a reminder that we need to evaluate whether our systems, our pipelines are, are set up in such a way uh, that we are going to be safe when that catastrophic catastrophic event happens. Are we ready? Exactly right. And, and, and the, the way that we respond, I mean, clearly an earthquake spawns fires quite often. It's, it spawns fires as a, as a result of gas mains being broken. So we really have to understand the technology, what's being done to put them out in a, in a quick fashion. And, and this clearly is ways, raising more questions now. Are we going on over an hour at this point that we, that we believe? About two. Almost two right? hours now. Uh, so can they shut off the gas quickly? And what about in right. our own homes? Many of us don't actually know where to do that in our own homes, right? right? And this is a good reminder that... Uh, it's so we, important to have that wrench outside, have it by your valve, know where the valve is, just understand how to do this and how to, how to get it done. All right, right now we want to go back out to ABC 7's Vic Lee out at the scene. Vic, you've talked to more people. Uh, I know you've got some new information for us. Yeah. Well, we are uphill from uh, Parker and Geary, and as you can see, flames still shooting up into the air some 30, 40 feet. Every time the wind blows, the flames grow bigger. Uh, firefighters spraying water not to not to uh, to put down the flames because that is a gas fire. PG&E, of course, has to turn off the gas source, but they are spraying the water onto the other buildings to keep the flames from spreading and of course to cool the atmosphere in that uh, in that street over there where the flames are shooting up um, we were told by san francisco fire that uh, at the time of the explosion when that uh, gas line was somehow compromised by those private contractors working on uh, fiber optics uh, that uh, there were apparently eight or ten people eight or ten workers around that area working but they were all safely evacuated. Again, they were mostly private contractors working on uh, the uh, fiber optics. We're also told that, uh, and as you mentioned here, I was listening into your conversation just a little earlier, that the Hong Kong Lounge appears to have been badly damaged, perhaps destroyed. That is the building to left of screen. Uh, and uh, you can see the blackened out portion of that building, which is closest to the front. To the flames. Several businesses also damaged, as well as those residential units on the top. 
I spoke to a PG&E worker uh, just moments ago who told me that basically what they are trying to do to cut that uh, to cut that gas line uh, is uh, they've got several options actually but what they are doing now is and you might see some of the workers again left of screen digging a hole uh, they are actually trenching they are trenching to squeeze off that gas from the gas line uh, they're also looking and perhaps at this time uh, actually turning valves off in the surrounding area to try to squeeze the gas off that way there is no timetable for when that gas will be shut down uh, there are dozens of firefighters just waiting to go into action the moment that is done so that is the very latest uh, from uphill Parker and Geary as you know Geary is a main thoroughfare in the Richmond district and this is actually Jordan Hill uh, we have an update here let's carry it can you give us an update hold on this is what we're going to do because I want to give you guys access I need one camera it's gonna be a pool camera everybody's gonna get that feet they're actually talking about moving us getting a getting a pool camera to go into the uh, closer to the fire zone so that's the very latest I think they're going to move us but uh, you can still see the fire is still going on strong uh, pg and &E trying to turn the gas off back to you in the studio all right Dick thanks very much now let's go to ABC 7's Kate Larson on the phone Kate what do you have Hey there. Well, I'm in the neighborhood on a block that's actually under shelter in place orders. I actually came to my friend's house who lives here, and they told me that uh, they heard the sirens, that they heard the helicopters overhead, and noticed that their power went off this afternoon. So they went outside, and shortly thereafter, the police very quickly asked them to go inside and stay inside. My friends say, do we need to evacuate? They were obviously concerned about what was happening just two blocks away, and they said, no, no evacuations yet. But I can tell you everyone is very very much on edge in this neighborhood. I've spoken to some firefighters just two minutes ago who were huffing and puffing completely out of breath, trying to get new oxygen tanks to their fellow firefighters who are here in the field, obviously trying to make sure that everyone stays safe. The police are on edge too, very anxious to make sure that folks driving around don't go down streets that are under shelter in place orders because there's no traffic allowed. We're just about a block and a half from where all of this happened. So there are still people though wandering around in the neighborhood just sort of looking around like what is happening because this is obviously very unexpected on a Wednesday afternoon in this relatively quiet part of San Francisco. Okay, you're just a, a block or a block and a half away. What do you see, feel and hear in terms of the of this of these flames and this smoke? Is it can you feel it just a block or a block and a half away? I, well, you know what I hear is a lot of helicopters right now, and there's sort of uh, a rush of water, an increasing amount of water that's coming off of the fire hoses and just coming into the neighborhood. So clearly, the San Francisco Fire Department is just dumping a ton of water on this because we're two blocks away, and it's, you know, a small little river collecting on the side of the road. And actually, just a few minutes ago, I did smell smoke sort of similar to a house fire. Um, haven't smelled a ton of it, haven't seen a ton of smoke, but I have smelled a little, and you definitely hear all the fire car, uh, uh, helicopters and the first responders in the area um, and a lot of water and concerned folks around here, understandably. Of course. That's uh, Kate Larson on the scene, um, and thanks for your time, Kate. But, Kristen, you can clearly see that there is more smoke slash steam coming off of that location now. I mean, the winds have shifted, and of course the big concern is whether the flames would get into another series of buildings or another building and, and cause more damage. Yep, they're hoping to limit it to just the four right now that have been affected. Uh, but as we were talking about all, the, all that water that's being put on that area, uh, another issue, and this of course much later on, but when we have overnight temperatures lows below freezing, uh, you are going to create more problems, some of which include possible black ice on the roadways, mm -hmm. which I know San Franciscans don't think about a lot. We don't confront that very frequently. Uh, that could certainly be an issue as well. You know, and you just have to think of, just for a moment about those firefighters on top of that building right now. Mm -hmm. They are in such a precarious position. They are putting their lives on the line to protect San Franciscans. Um, clearly, they are battling their best to keep that fire in the building above the, the Hong Kong lounge to to keep it contained to that area mm -hmm. um, but as these as these flames continue now it's it's been so long
long. The question is, when will PG&E finally get that out? They have dug trenches trying to squeeze off that line. Apparently, there's no valve in the area that would get the job done. They're actually going to go through the process of digging around the pipe and squeezing it off. Yeah. Uh, we're expecting a news conference here in just a moment, Chris, and hopefully we'll get some new answers about why that process is taking so long and what other other things they could do to resolve the situation. And you mentioned the remote shutoff that had been recommended by the CPUC. Uh, it'd be interesting to hear whether their thoughts on that um, and their progress on that may change as a result of what's happening here. But you can see the trenching that we have been referring to. It is labor intensive. Uh, they started across the street. There are two points. They got to squeeze it off um, because the shutoff point is right at where that fire is burning, where that gas is coming out right now. Right. So um, this could go on for some time. I know PG&E does not want to commit. They don't want to give an ETA. And we can understand. They don't know. But, uh, Dan, we are now going into an area of so many hours, it's starting to feel like the San Bruno pipeline explosion of 2010 right. when that gas was just going for a four or five hours unabated. It was going on and on and All on, night, and, right? they, and they couldn't find the valve, and when the workers finally found the valve, it was jammed up and they couldn't get it closed. So uh, we just hope that that's Oh, and there was a water situation there, too. Right, Remember right. that? Absolutely, that's uh, right. Fortunately, we're not encountering that here, and it looks like they're putting quite a ton of water on those buildings to protect those buildings. They're not putting it on the fire directly because that is fed by gas. Uh, but yes, as you mentioned, a news conference will be starting shortly where we expect new information, hopefully with regard to their plan for shutting this off. And Kristen, we just got dramatic new audio from the first firefighters on the scene of the, glass, the gas explosion. Let's take a listen. Hey, we got some water. We're not going to extinguish the main. We're not going to Wow. And you heard that, what you were talking about, Dan, right? We're not going to put water on the flames. It's a gas main. There's gas coming out. So we're going to put it on the buildings. And that's precisely what they've been doing for the past few hours at uh, much peril to the firefighters who are on that roof that's weakening by the moment. Oh, exactly right. And, and people might think, oh, just, just put some foam on there. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't want to put out the flames because then you have the gas gathering and potential more explosions and more fire. All right. Right now we want to turn to um, Kelly with the University of San Francisco USF, which, as we've been reporting, is in that area. Uh, Kelly, thanks for joining us. Can you tell us how far away are you from where this is happening and how that's impacted your campus and students? Sure. Um, thanks for having me on. We are one block away. Uh, we are one block south of where the fire is. So USF is split across a couple of blocks, and the closest uh, location is the Lone Mountain campus, which is on um, Turk and Parker. So we're about a, one block um, outside of the fire. So what does this mean for you guys? I mean, clearly there's got to be uh, challenges for students to get to and from, but have you evacuated your buildings? Have you canceled classes for the rest of the day? What's happening? We are actually um, business as usual right now. Our public safety has been in contact with the city and county authorities, and we are not under evacuation orders. No USF buildings have been evacuated. We're remaining in contact with the authorities, and if that changes, we'll alert our students and USF community through our email and text alert system, as well as uh, messages on our website. But right now, we have no reports of any injuries, and no USF buildings have been evacuated. But aren't you telling students or faculty to not come to the campus if they're not already there because firefighters are urging people to stay away from that area in general? We are telling students to stay away from the immediate area of the fire, but um, we do have students here that live on campus, that live nearby, that have been alerted to uh, stay away from the area, but they are still, our, and campus is still open, so they're still able to come through different routes. But to stay away from the immediate area, absolutely. Okay. But well, this clearly, clearly is an ongoing situation. I would assume that you are watching it closely, uh, Kelly, to, to, to make sure that nothing changes and perhaps uh, that, that there is no further danger to the campus. Um, clearly, if something changes, you, you would make changes as well. Absolutely. Our public safety has kept us in constant contact. They are getting updates with uh, police department and fire, city, and county. If anything changes at all or there's any threat, we will immediately 
uh, alert the campus community, all of our students, through text uh, emergency alerts and phone calls and on our website as well. And we will get all of that infor information out immediately uh, if the situation changes at all. Kelly Sampson with USF, thank you so much. And here we thank go you. to the news conference with, that is, uh, San Francisco Fire ready? Chief Joanne Hayes-White. I'm Lieutenant Jonathan Baxter, San Francisco Fire Department. This will be our 315 media update for the incident at Parker and Geary Street. Chief Joanne Hayes-White. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the story is about the same as it was an hour ago when I addressed you. Uh, fire department crews have declared a third alarm. We're on scene containing this fire. There was a gas main that was breached at about 1.18 when we were called to the scene. Uh, we're working closely with pg &E. They are on scene and actively trying to mitigate this incident. Uh, at this point, the change from an hour ago is that we had uh, the fire building and three uh, buildings involved. Now we have an additional building across the street uh, from 3300 Geary, which has uh, sustained some damage. At this point, the main, the good news is that there are no injuries associated with this incident. Uh, I'm standing next to Paul Doherty, who's a spokesperson for PG&E. If you want to give a brief statement, obviously this is the, the early stages. PG&E has been on scene, working shoulder to shoulder with us, trying to mitigate this incident. We believe there was a private contractor doing some fiber optic work in the street when a gas uh, line was hit. Paul. Thank you, Chief Hayes White. Uh, as Chief, and, uh, right thank you, thank you, but Chief, Hay Chief Hayes White. Uh, my name is Paul Doherty. I'm a spokesperson with PG&E. Um, and uh, as Chief mentioned, uh, we are working hand in hand, shoulder to shoulder, with the fire department uh, to make the situation safe. Our gas crew, our crews are on site, and um, we had initial reports indicate that uh, this was a third-party dig-in um, related to a construction project, and. Uh, not, not in any way associated with PG&E. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we're working diligently and safely and as quickly as possible to resolve the situation. Can you guys turn the gas what's off taking so long? Uh, as soon as we have more information uh, based on our crew's activity, we can give you an update. Have you talked about how this is going to, you know, what's the protocol? How is this all going to work, the process involved right now, and why it might be taking so long? Uh, as I mentioned, we'll have more information as soon as that's available. We're actively working in the situation right now to get this resolved. Why, why hasn't PG&E turned off the gas yet? Why hasn't PG&E turned the gas off yet? I, 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 I want to speculate right now, but as I mentioned, we're working as quickly as possible to get this resolved. Thank you. I don't, I don't have information on that. All that it's so early that all that's under investigation. Chief, you mentioned there's three buildings, there's three buildings involved. Three buildings involved, and now there's now a fourth that's being damaged. There's a total of five buildings: the fire building itself, which is at the corner of Geary and Parker, plus four others at this point. And so they're mixed commercial and residential. We anticipate uh, some displacements, and we have some reunification sites. One is at Mel's Diner, I believe it's 3335 Geary, Mel's Diner down the street, uh, and then it looks like St. Mary's Cathedral will open up their doors. Uh, if needed, and it will be needed most likely tonight uh, for the displaced residents. Chief, you had said no victims at this point, but have you had any opportunity to get into any of the fire buildings so we can say that definitively? My understanding is that at this point, uh, there are no injuries associated with it. We have cordoned off and set up a perimeter on uh, a block on each side of where the incident is. All those buildings uh, were, were gone through and searched, a uh, combination of police and fire, to make sure residents were alerted and out and evacuated. Five, five five buildings. Buildings. Total of five buildings involved at this time. Well, so and if I, I, I'm here to. The neighborhood, the neighborhood. They're not a means to do that. We're in the heart of an earthquake country, and we think it'd be a quicker way to just kill the gas in the entire neighborhood. Well, as soon as we have more information, we'll share that with you. But as I mentioned, our crews are working actively right now to resolve the situation. Paul, in a situation like this, when that gas line is shut off, can you say how? shut off for neighboring people who live here when they finally can return home. I can't speculate that on every situation is different. Uh, this is an active situation, but we should have more information for you uh, very shortly, hopefully within the next half hour or so. Chief, you said some people might be out of their homes tonight? Yes. About how yes. many? Uh, no uh, definitive number yet, but there's, there's, there's five hundreds? buildings involved. I don't think hundreds, but, uh, you know, uh, under 100 probably, but it's hard to say. Do we expect more buildings? Do we expect the fire to spread to more buildings? Now, in the last hour, we had another building that has been engulfed. We well. did. We did. Uh, I have a high degree of confidence that we're, we're doing a very good job containing it. Um, the damage to that additional building that wasn't there an hour ago is, is minimal at this point, mostly water damage and some periphery exterior damage. Uh, we're doing our best. Uh, we've been at this for two hours now. The crews are doing a great job uh, containing so that there will be no further exposure damage. And then again, our main objective collectively is life safety. Sure.
That's a little early to determine. So once the the gas situation is mitigated, the fire shortly thereafter will be contained and controlled. It's not. It's con we believe it's contained at this point, but it's certainly not under control. It won't be under control until PGD manages the gas in incident. Do you think you go by the undetermined at this point, sir. Does it disturb you that a ruptured gas line is taking more than an hour and a half to clamp off? I mean, isn't the idea of these shutoffs? So you can do it quicker than an hour and a half? Certainly, as the fire chief and as a resident, yes, the sooner the better. Uh, I can say that they're, 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 wor they're working very diligently, pg &E. But um, yes, I would have liked to have seen it mitigated sooner. Uh, but again, I want to, you know, I want to, I want to say that it's a complex incident, and right now, that I'm happy because right now we've had no report of injuries. That's the main objective. Uh, you know, the property damage, we're not happy about that, but certainly life safety is always our main goal. Paul, during the last explosion in 2017, it took PG&E three hours to turn off the gas. Do you think that's acceptable? You know, as I mentioned, we, you know, our, our number one priority is the safety of the public and of the, you know, the customers we serve and of our communities. So I, I, we're going to work as hard as possible, safely, as quickly as possible to get this situation resolved. Do you agree it should be turned off ASAP? I, I definitely agree that we will work as quickly as possible, do everything we can to ensure the safety of our customers and of San Francisco residents. We have one question, one time, time for one more question, please. Do you know if the workers at Hong Kong Lounge are accounted for? Uh, at this time, we have had no reports of anyone missing. But again, it's a fluid situation, so I wouldn't want to speak in absolutes. But right now, we've had no reports of anyone missing at this time or injuries. And until uh, the fire is under control, I would suggest that we would have hourly updates to the press up here. So we will have our next media briefing at 4.30 at this location, 4.30. Thank you, everybody. Can you explain what's complicated about this? This channel can hear well. Well, as I mentioned, we, we don't have water in right now. We'll get I mean, just what are the factors? I mean, I understand well, that they have to do a lot of digging That's underground. Right. They're deep? Yeah. All right, you've been watching a live news conference. San Francisco Fire Chief Joanne Hayes-White, along with uh, PG&E, uh, Paul Doherty there, addressing how long this will take before their crews can shut off that gas. That is the question that reporters kept asking. Uh, but Dan, he repeatedly said, our priority is to get it done safely. We don't know when. Uh, basically, not answering how long this could take. And not answering whether uh, this should have been done, could have been done. Would you have liked to see it done sooner? He clearly had the line that he was going to say again and again and again. And look, it's been over two hours now since this mm -hmm. fire started. Do you think that PG&E would have some explanation about how long it will take them? Um, their process. Uh, is there a valve in that area? Explain the process of, tr of trenching and pinching off that gas line, which they apparently are doing. Why couldn't the spokesman for PG&E explain that process that those crews are urgently doing right now? Mm -hmm. I, I'm surprised by that. But, you know, but, but there was some news also out of that news conference, mainly from Joanne Hayes White of the fire department. It's up to a third alarm. It's, there's now a fifth building involved, 330 Geary. It has sustained damage. Um, that she, one is actually across the street. Right. And we're told uh, there's an H&R Block office there. Uh, and that is what we were talking about. Should the winds change, right. right, you could have the fire spread across the street a quarter mile away. Um, and that is why you do want to shut off the gas as soon as possible. And that's the danger. And as you can see from our from our pictures here from the helicopter, the the fire hoses are not trained on the fire. They're trained on the buildings Building. to prevent the flames from catching those buildings on fire. It's essential that they get that fire out now. It's, and again, it's been over two hours since that thing exploded. Yep. Um, and and Joanne Hayes White also said that uh, she, you know she did reveal that over, under a hundred people, she said, could be out of their homes tonight um, as a result of this. There are people who are sheltering in place. Others have been uh, taken out of their homes for mm. safety purposes. Yes, Dan. And she also mentioned uh, for those people who are displaced. Place. Tonight, St. Mary's Cathedral will likely be a place that can take him in overnight. And also, uh, Mel's Diner, which is on Gary, a landmark there, has been set up as a reunification site. But yes, once again, she reiterated that there have been no injuries. That's rather miraculous. Um, right. And the eight workers who have been working 
uh, for that private contractor have been accounted for and that despite the lunch service going on at the very popular Hong Kong lounge, um, they're not aware of any injuries with regard to that restaurant. And we should circle back about how this all started. We yeah. understand from PG&E that a third party construction crew did call 811 and get information about what gas pipes were there to actually get the utility to mark the gas line. So that process happened. Apparently, eight to ten workers were today using that excavator to dig into the street, and they hit that gas line. And as you said, it's just a miracle that none of those eight to ten people were injured when this thing went up. Yeah. Just imagine the impact. Uh, people are now describing the flames as sounding like a jet engine coming up out of, out of the ground, and you know that heat is so intense from what we know from the, you know, the San Bruno gas pipeline explosion. Mm -hmm. um, again, right. It's a four-story fireball. Oh, exactly right. Exactly right. Uh, this sounds like a jet engine. Yeah. Uh, that's something that neither you or I wants to see and or experience in our lifetime. Somebody could have been standing on that corner waiting to cross the street. That is a very busy street. Anyone who knows San Francisco knows that Geary and especially that area is right. full of businesses and apartments and children crossing the street with their grandmothers. Exactly uh, right. It is a miracle. Well, but just take a look at that excavator there on the left and look how close it is to where those flames are emanating from. Mm -hmm. And imagine the person sitting in that excavator having punctured that, uh, punctured that gas pipeline. Clearly, yeah. there, there must have been a delay between when he hit the, the gas pipeline, he realized his mistake and got out of there because it, it, it wasn't an instantaneous explosion or else he, he'd be gone right now. Mm -hmm. So there is no information that anybody's been hurt in this. I mean, that, you know, that's the positive here. Yeah. But the negative is we're going on well over two hours. Let's see, the break happened at 1.18. It's now 3.20. 27. It's, that's two hours and 10 minutes that this has been allowed to just continue. And the best answer that we can get from PG&E is we are working on it. They're working on it. You can see right. the workers there trenching. They're just not able to give an estimate. Uh, our Laura Anthony has been out there and she managed to talk with a witness just moments ago. If we have that queued up, let's take a listen. As I was walking, I heard like a, like a small explosion or something behind me. And I looked up and I saw people in front of me and they just started screaming and yelling. And I turned around at that point and I saw flames kind of growing toward me. I actually thought there was, there was a bomb for a second. It was just kind of erupting. And so I just took off running down the street. Uh, and then when I got to the end of the block, there were a lot of people standing and watching. So at that point, I turned around and I saw that it was this big fire. So it looks like we have uh, our video there has cut off. We're back now live. You can see um, overhead of this gas line break in San Francisco, an excavator having cut the gas line, huge flames going up into the sky. Uh, fire crews doing, doing their best to keep other buildings from catching on fire. But Joanne Hayes White just moments ago did reveal that a fifth building has been involved. That is the H&R block office, it looks mm -hmm. like, across the street. Yes. Uh, and Dan, while you were just talking about that, we just got some new information in with regard to the contractor. Uh, the private contractor, we understand the permit was issued to MCI Metro, mm -hmm. Verizon, uh, Mastec, that's M-A-S-T-E-C, was the construction crew that was involved. And the permit was issued to MCI Metro, Verizon. Right. Installing fiber optic equipment. And apparently, um, it looks as though Mastec has refused to comment. Yes. Uh, we, we, our staff here at ABC7, has tried to get Mastec to comment on this. They are the, the third party construction crew that had that excavator out there today. They have refused to comment about what's happened. Um, clearly, these are these are subjects that we will be investigating in the hours and days to come you know what is Mastec's record um, have they had any OSHA violations have they had any other incidents like this in their recent past you're thinking about the research you're about to start yeah, doing exactly in the hours right. ahead Dan. exactly right um, and of course Verizon's got to be doing this kind of work all over the Bay Area all the time exactly right and you know as we discussed earlier PG&E was hit last December for having thousands of violations of the 811 one system. They were not responding quickly enough to excavators who were trying to work around where there could be uh, gas lines. And so PG&E has this history of also falsifying some documents about reports um, in the 811 system. But in this case today, it looks as though that system worked. 
Um, Mass Tech apparently contacted PG&E for the uh, for the 811 clearance to dig in the area. They marked the lines, and so it looks as though that process worked properly in this instance. But what didn't work properly was the crew somehow made that mistake mm -hmm. to cut into the line, and here we are. And, and Lori Anthony did try to ask the PG&E spokesman, uh, Jason King, how that kind of mishap could potentially happen. Uh, he didn't want to get into that. Right. Um, and certainly, of course, in this case, they're going to have to interview everybody involved. Yeah. Uh, and lucky that they are around to be interviewed. Certainly in this case, when you look at those pictures, it's incredible. But uh, yeah. a lot of questions. And an another question I have, uh, in this day and age of all the technology we have, is the best that we can do to shut off this fire, that we dig a hole in the street and pinch the line? Is that the state of our of our high technology in, in the Bay Area and across the country for that matter? I mean, that's a question that we have to find out. I mean, are there valves in the area? Are they reachable? Um, were any of these new remote shutoff valves put in in San Francisco as the PUC has pushed PG&E to do since the San Bruno gas pipeline explosion back in 2010? So here's the question I have for you. I know you've done a lot of research into this area. Um, how often is it a recommendation versus an order uh, set up with a timeline for retrofitting. You got to get this done by this time. And certainly with these lawsuits going on and and them being in the court system, if you will, there must be some mandates. Exactly right. And, and that's something I've been really coming upon again and again over the past uh, several weeks. You know, you come up with all these plans. You come up with a, with a wildfire, say, plan from PG&E. So who is enforcing it? Who is watching to make sure that that work is getting done? And so short answer to you right now is I don't know at this point. But that is a very important question. So the PUC has a recommendation for them to take these steps. Uh, what enforcement has there been? Uh, have they been watching? Is there, a, is there accountability on them actually installing these remote shutoff valves? Those are all questions that we really need to, to follow up on. But right now, the first most immediate thing is, is to get those flames out. Yeah, and we continue to watch. Just to recap for our audience who's joining us now, the reason we're on and not World News Tonight is because we have a major breaking news story we've been following in San Francisco for the past two hours and about right. 15 minutes now, that being this massive natural gas explosion in San Francisco, a three-alarm fire, um, busy Gary at Parker, uh, where there's UCS, there is that Hong Kong lounge building that's been damaged greatly. There's... Um, Mel's Diner, the H, &R H &R block. block, yeah. It's, it's a very busy area. It happened at 118, and that's been kind of been the ongoing question. How much longer will it take for pg &E to put out those flames? Now, uh, going on two hours and, and 15 minutes here, right. at this point, we know that um, a third-party construction contractor had an excavator out there, and uh, even though pg &E had marked where the gas line is, that crew somehow cut into that line. It was a 12-inch main, A 12-inch right? main, that's right. There were 8 to 10 workers who were there at the yep. time. But they apparently escaped safely. We have no reports of anybody getting hurt at this point. Mm -hmm. But so fast forward here, we just hear that there's a fifth building now involved, and that's the real danger now. While these flames continue, will there be more buildings involved? We hope not. But the fire chief just told us a moment ago that a fifth building has been involved. It is a densely populated area. Those buildings are very close together in that area of San Francisco with mixed-use buildings, residential on top, businesses on the bottom. And the building that is right there at the corner where that natural gas continues to feed those flames, uh, still not shut off, uh, that is the very popular dim sum restaurant known by a lot of folks in that part of the city, Hong Kong Lounge 2. Right. And it happened during the lunch hour. Uh, it is amazing. Everyone in the restaurant that we know of, that the fire officials know of, got out safely, along with eight workers you were talking about with that private contractor that was um, putting in fiber optic equipment underground. Um, and we understand now, having done research, is that permit was issued to MCI Metro slash Verizon. And Mass Tech was the construction crew involved with the backhoe that apparently breached that main um, they're not commenting to us, um, but just to summarize, if you're just joining us right now, we have eight people who have been accounted for, no injuries, uh, five buildings involved. One is the one that's badly damaged. The other four, including one across the street, have had some peripheral uh, exterior damage. Firefighters are putting water just on the buildings, not on the gas-fed flames. 
and right now you have a whole block, more than that, one block perimeter has been shut off. They don't want you nearby. They've evacuated it. Uh, this does mean the 38 Geary, your major transit, bus transit home, uh, that is not happening around that area, is being detoured. USF just told us they are continuing on as usual with their students' classes. However, getting there could be challenging. Um, due to all the work that is happening. Exactly right. And several of the witnesses told us live on the air here that this sounds like a jet engine, that those flames coming out of the, out of the pavement sounds like a jet engine, something we heard also from the San Bruno gas pipeline explosion. And, and the big question of the hour right now is, how much longer will it take PG&E to put out these flames? And uh, the spokesman there didn't have an answer, clearly. He had to say the same thing, we're, we're workly, working as quickly as we can. Um, and from what we know, though, from people on the scene, it looks as though they have no shutoff valve that is readily available at that area. It's right at the fire, in it, fact. It, it, well, that's right? what we heard, correct. It's right at the fire, so it's not accessible. And so you have crews there digging by hand, digging mm -hmm. under the pavement, trying to get to the 12-inch the gas main. Mm -hmm. And at some point, they're going to pinch it to just mm -hmm. close it off. Mm -hmm. and, and that can't come soon enough. Mm -hmm. It does sound like a very laborious, time-consuming process. We can only hope they are well-practiced and able to get that done sooner rather than later. Are the flames gone? Am I seeing? Or is it just so much smoke that we can't well, see? Well, that's the Let's question see. here. Um, I'm, I'm not seeing flames right now in this picture. Well, we'll check with our crews on the scene and ask them what they're seeing. But certainly, yeah, from the Sky 7 shot, it looks like... Oh, all right. Our Laura Anthony has just confirmed to us they have, in fact, shut off that gas. It so, is off, so that's why you're not seeing the fireball anymore. So two hours and 19 minutes after it happened, mm -hmm. it looks as though crews have been successful in shutting off that gas main. And our Laura Anthony is live now on the scene. Laura, what do you have? We're working to establish contact with Laura, uh, who has just informed us that they have successfully shut off the gas. And, and there's see, the spot right there. Yep. You can see there is the excavator that was right next to that roaring column of flame. The flames are gone now. And now it's just putting water on the buildings um some of it very damaged we have five buildings affected and you can see they're still putting water on it there are still hot spots obviously right. they don't want it to spread to any more buildings and just as soon as we're able to go to laura we will do so to talk about how they were finally able to manage uh, to shut off that gas and what worked for them they have been trenching we knew that they were going to squeeze it off at different points and we knew that so they have done it so that is the good news huge news i mean that that is the best news all day obviously to yeah. see those flames finally going out that that's just an enormous thing and it was i have to say there was an excitement going through this newsroom but it finally got done and now the crews can fully turn not just from containment but from actually fighting the fires in those buildings that are involved mm -hmm. we heard there were five buildings involved uh, clearly the building above the hong kong lounge two was the most involved mm -hmm. suffered the most damage but uh again no one hurt at this point in time and uh and so good news yeah. that is finally out now something that is not so great is that we have about a hundred people or so who are now being displaced due to the fire we have Cynthia from the Red Cross on the phone with us to talk about your assistance efforts as you always engage in doing such great work uh, Cynthia tell us what you are doing now to help so the American Red Cross we're working with our partners with the fire department and the San Francisco Department of Emergency Management We've brought out our emergency response vehicle and are at one of the reunification sites at Mel's Diner, uh, providing snacks, water, information, comfort to both displaced residents as well as firefighters. We've also are identifying a place for people to stay overnight uh, so they have somewhere to go um, as they can wait and be safe and warm um, as the firefighters are able to take care of this. The fire chief had said that that may be St. Mary's Cathedral. Is that still being firmed up? That is what we have tentatively identified, so we will confirm that, and when that opens, we will let people know. So, so, so what types of things do people need in something like this, Cynthia? What, what is the, the biggest need in an, an incident like this? Well, in an incident like this, especially in the winter on a very cold day that this is, a warm place, 
uh, warm drinks, food, but as well when you have a, a sudden disaster like this, there's also the emotional support. So our volunteers are trained to be present to people, to help them get through the uncertainty, to coordinate with our partners to provide as much information as they have to the residents uh, so they can start planning um, and wait while they wait. Cynthia, in your capacity of helping people and running that reunification site at Mel's Diner, uh, have you heard any harrowing stories, encountered anyone who got out of that Hong Kong lounge restaurant or that building? Um, our teams are just gotten on the scene, and so they are just making their, um, just right now connecting with people, so I don't have any specific stories right now. But typically, there's a, there's a lot of shock and confusion initially, where people are just trying to figure out, and, and we will be definitely there to hear their stories and provide them support as they wrestle on what has happened today. All right, Cynthia, uh, thank you so much. Before you go, real quickly, you know, whether it's this emergency or any other emergencies, what would you advise families? So it's always important to have an emergency plan. So what, what would you do if there was a sudden disaster that you were affected, whether it's an earthquake, a fire, talk with your family, have a plan. How would you reconnect? And what is your disaster kit like? Do you have a disaster kit so that you're able to stay at a shelter, have things that you personally need to provide extra comfort. So we always recommend we have information on our website as well as on our free emergency app on how people can build their disaster plan as well as what they should have in their disaster kit. All right, Cynthia Shaw with the American Red Cross, thank you so much. We'll continue to work with you once you guys have that shelter site firmed up. Uh, we'll push that out to our viewers as well to let everybody know. But thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Uh, and so now uh, the questions the questions that we have is what worked, right? So how did they finally get it off? Was it the fact that they could dig that trench and finally pinch that line closed? I mean, that's the good news. Right? I know. Uh, Laura Anthony has some insight on that. She was out there and she's still out there. Vic Lee is as well. Uh, many of our reporters, Kate Larson. So uh, we'll have full coverage starting at 4 o'clock, of course. All the reporters will be filing the information. So we'll be digging deeper into this part in the pun, but uh, not meant to be funny at all. But I just want to express the point that we will have extensive coverage in depth coming up at 4. And we're now looking at some more information about, uh, about the uh, contractor. Mastec it is, right? Uh, they are the crew, and then of course you have the permit. Um, MCI Metro Verizon was the one who hired Mastec to do the actual digging work. Now the, uh, the San Francisco fire chief says a company laying down fiber optic lines hit that gas line. Mm -hmm. ABC 7 News has learned that a permit was issued to MCI Metro Verizon. Mastec was the construction crew involved. I've done just a quick search and there are several companies by the name of Mastec, some which are inactive, others which are, are active. Mm -hmm. Now the question is, are they active? Are they following uh, the rules the way they should? Um, let's look at their record and find out uh, about any potential problems in the past. Well, in the meantime, we did call them and uh, whoever answered the phone did hang up on us. Uh, so I think we probably reached the correct MASDAQ. Um, they didn't wish to comment then, but I'm sure in the days ahead, you will be finding a lot more information through the I-Team on their record. We will be record. working it, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, just to recap for you, the natural gas explosion happened at about 118 when a construction crew punctured a 12-inch main. That has now been shut off, but it took about two and a half hours, nearly that. It was two hours, 19 minutes. Yeah. Now, we were watching that rage, and we were watching the buildings adjacent. All in all, five buildings, four there on that corner, one across the street, suffered damage. Fortunately, again, the great news out of all this is that apparently no word of any injuries. And we know from experience this could have been much worse, obviously, mm -hmm. right? There's mm -hmm. no loss of life. There is damage there, and there, were, there are people there who had their homes affected. There are bu businesses that have had their homes affected. Those firefighters put their lives on the line. You saw them just dangling up on top of those roofs as the, um, as the buildings were involved in flames and trying to keep those flames from spreading to other buildings in the area. Five buildings in all that were affected by, these, by this uh, explosion and flames. Uh, the start at when the contractor cut into a gas main, a 12-inch gas main, uh, just after 1 o'clock today. Just look at that wide shot of the city. Uh, you can see, as we look to the western part mm. of the city, you can see that smoke uh, just really dominating the skyline there uh, at its height, 
you know, spreading several blocks and rising really high into the sky. Just the fireball itself was about four stories. It was. And, you know, in seeing that shot, Kristen, I mean, to me, that looks like, look at how densely populated we are. That's right. And, and how quickly the flames could spread if it wasn't stopped. Uh, and we have another witness who has called in to join us by phone. Bailey, uh, are you still out at the scene now? Um, no, I'm not. After uh, our students were released for the day, I went home. Okay, are you at USF? No, okay. uh, there is a high school Wallenberg, Wallenberg that okay. is, um, it's very close to USS and, um, tell me about what happened. Where were you when the explosion happened? And you mentioned the students, whether they're all okay. Uh, walk us through your experience today. All right. All of, all of the students are okay. Um, it was near the end of our day. I work in a special day classroom with adults with disabilities at Wallenberg. Mm -hmm. um, and I was looking out of the window that faces the area where the fire was. Um, and as I was looking out the window, I heard like what everyone else has said, like a, a noise, like a jet engine and saw the fire shoot into the sky. I guess that must have been immediately after the gas main was hit. Um, and I, I screamed and we all ran to the window. Um, it was, it was really scary. No doubt. Yeah. Especially with the students there. Um, have you ever experienced anything quite like this in terms of the intensity and, and how stunning and frightening it was? Um, I, I never have personally witnessed a fire like this before now. Yeah. Uh, just glad you are all okay and mm -hmm. it seems like the incident is behind us given that they have now shut off the gas but uh, it is definitely something for all of san francisco in that densely populated area to you know consider how will we handle this in the future how will yeah right thank you so much for your time billy thanks glad you're okay well, so, well, so there you go. Uh, the, the good news is it's the fire is out. The cleanup is underway. The crew, the fire crews are there in those five buildings to make sure that nothing else is smoldering, that it doesn't somehow flare up. Uh, they, tumped, they dumped a ton of water on those buildings in the area mm -hmm. with those flames 35, 40 feet high coming out of the hole in the pavement where the excavator cut in there. You can see here, uh, the close-up there, that uh, pink red building is Hong Kong Lounge 2. Yeah, and Dan, look at, oh, Sky 7 just moved away, but you can see just water. It's like a river pouring out of that entryway, that hallway into the street. Uh, that is how much water they've been putting into that building or onto that building, and they continue to do so. So it's, it's a river flowing out of that building, and, you know, we were talking about, um, oh, Look at that. Yeah, it, that it looks as though flames? there's a little little flare up there yep. on that hood on the roof. And does that look to be the same building as the Hong Kong Lounge 2? Yeah, it does look as though is that the is. Yeah, it is. So they are still dealing with some flare ups there. The flames are not totally out. They are pouring water on that, both from the, uh, from the ladder and from the trucks on the ground as well. They're still working this, and you have those uh, firefighters up on the roof in the building adjacent to it. Um, clearly a, a very dangerous job they're doing today. Um, but, but again, looking back on this, it could have been much worse. No reports of injuries at this point, um, and no reports of firefighters uh, having suffered any injuries. Our Kate Larson was in a, was a block away, and she saw firefighters kind of trying to catch their breath and and trying to pick up some new oxygen tanks to allow them to continue their work there. You see it, there's, there's some more flames there in that um, building where the original fire uh, started after the backhoe hit that gas line just out front. And you can see the water pouring out of the right steps there. there at the Hong Kong uh, Lounge 2 there on Geary Boulevard. Uh, right now, we are looking at new video tweeted by the San Francisco Fire Department. It says we have the gas shut off. Crews are working to extinguish um, buildings at five this time. buildings five at this buildings. time. Okay. And there are no injuries and, and continue to avoid the area. They are suggesting, of course, a good idea yeah. to avoid the area. Yeah. All right, so that's how it looks now live. But we also want to show you some video that we just got of when the fire first broke out. Take a look at this. Oh, look at that. And so the flames are not that tall at this point. So you can see that the, the natural gas is coming out of the uh, out of the ground quickly, 
Look at that back, though, and the way the fire is burning. Oh, my through. goodness. And you can see the flames starting there on the ground, the backhoe on fire. But the natural gas is going to catch there. It's catching now. The flame is starting to get taller there. Um, and also, we saw in that shot through the windows of that Hong Kong lounge building, lots of flames. Look at that. Uh, burning, consuming the inside of the building. So that building right there has extensive loss. I, I'm not able to say if it's a total loss, but right. definitely that restaurant is not going to be in operation for a while. Well, that fills in one piece of the puzzle for us that we wondered how no one could have been hurt here. Even the man who was in that excavator, I assume he's the man who could have been a woman, mm -hmm. but the person in the excavator who was uh, operating that cut the gas line. We wondered how could he have escaped with his life. And there you looked in the early part of this video that you didn't see the massive flames that we had um, a little bit later, that there was a time when the gas was, was coming up out of the ground, whooshing like a jet engine, like the people mm -hmm, say, mm -hmm. and he would have had time to get away. And in fact, he did get away. And look, there it is now. There you go. Look at those flames. And that was so much gas pouring out for two hours and about 20 minutes. Um, it took them that long to be able to shut it off, in part due to the fact that the rupture point is right where the, the gas was. The shutoff valve, I should say, That's is right. where the rupture point was. Look at that. And then those oh. PG&E crews did, did yeoman's work to dig the hole in the pavement to get down there on either side of that 12-inch gas main and to pinch it off, finally stopping uh, the gas just after, just uh, let's see, around 3.30 or so today. So that's, that was just an amazing step, one that we've been waiting for for, I clocked it at 2 hours and 19 minutes. Mm -hmm. so, so that's a very good uh, job they did. Um, clearly, they would have liked to have done it more quickly, as we all would have liked to have seen it done more quickly. But look at that. Just look at the roaring flames and how frightening it must be for the firefighters. And they knocked on every door there on that block to get people out. And at this point, they believe there are no injuries. And it was an important part of this process. You noticed that you never saw a firefighter really trying to, to put out the flames. They knew that they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to go directly at the gas line, that there was no way really to stop those flames. Mm -hmm. and, it, and if you did, in fact, dump some uh, foam on there, it could have caused a, uh, a myriad of other problems. And so they focused on watering down the buildings around the flames to make sure that they wouldn't also catch fire, mm -hmm. uh, as we heard. Even so, yeah. it spread across the street to That's that one right. building where the H&R block is. Exactly right. Um, and let's hope it's contained to just that. But in the meantime, we understand about 100 people will be displaced tonight in San Francisco due to this event and that the Red Cross is working to set up shelter at St. Mary's Cathedral. They will be confirming that. Um, in the meantime, if you're looking for your loved one, they have the reunification site set up at Mel's Diner where they are providing snacks, water, blankets, things of comfort, even counseling uh, should you need it. But for a lot of the witnesses we talked to, it was a sense of both um, awe and just being stunned by you know, we talked about the intensity of the heat. We talked about the size of the fireball. That that was four stories high. Right. We the sound that was so loud. Uh, uh, a jet engine is what they compared it to. Exactly right. And Kristen, as we said before, this comes on a day when PG&E was really being hit at many different fronts. Today mm -hmm. was the day that they are set scheduled to file their wildfire mitigation plan with the PUC. Uh, that was the story which I planned on working on be uh, before all this happened. Mm -hmm. But they are facing tough questions from the courts, from both the criminal courts, from the San Bruno uh, pipeline gas explosion case from 2010, and also uh, in, the, in the bankruptcy as well. They're trying to make sure the PG&E is do its, doing its most to keep all of us safe on these many different fronts. And so this is not the first time that the PG&E gas line protection and shutoff plan issue has come up. You mentioned the San Bruno pipeline explosion in which 38 homes were burned and uh, I believe eight people were killed. And luckily the result this time is not to that degree of devastation, but it's another good reminder of um, the dangers we face and the protocol that we need to develop to prevent it. Absolutely. Our Leanne Melendez is standing by now live with more. Leanne? Well, I'm going to tell you and talk about, Dan, about the impact that this is having on Muni customers. I am right now on Geary and Stanion, and let me tell you that this is going to have, be careful with that car. Sorry. Come on. Come on. Sorry. 
There is just a little bit of traffic here. Thank you very much. And so this is going to have a huge impact on people living on the northwest side of town. And that's because you have the number 38 bus, the Geary bus going through here. And actually, I see a bus right now, but it says not in service. So this is one of the busiest bus lines in San Francisco, if not the busiest. And just to give you an idea, uh, 55,000 customers take the 38 Geary on a daily basis. And um, of course, that's going back and forth, right? Uh, not just one way, 55,000 customers. Uh, and during this commute time, it goes by here every two minutes. And that's how busy it is. It is one of the busiest uh, bus corridors west of the Mississippi. So thank you to Paul Ro Rose from uh, Muni for giving us a little bit of information. Going, Let me just get that bus out of the way here. Not in service, of course, but it has to get through here. So that would have been the 38, the going by here. Um, of course, it is not uh, functioning at the moment because of this uh, explosion. Now, again, you have alternates. You have the number five line in that direction, the Fulton, the number 31 Balboa. That's a little bit further, but it's, it's good to go. You can take that one instead of the 38. And of course, you have to my right here in this direction, the number one, the California. All good, and that's what people have been doing. They've, they've been taking one of those three lines and then walking if they live in this area. Or people have been just walking uh, from uh, their workplace home. And uh, did you take the bus or anything? Anybody take the bus? You're just walking? Walking, walking. walking. OK, that's how people are getting around. Uh, that's how we know. Uh, people in San Francisco know what to do. When there's an emergency, they either walk or call a friend or something, but they do. We're doers here in San Francisco. Yeah. Anyway, that's what's happening, and don't expect the 38 to go by here any, anytime soon. Yeah. All right, Leanne, thank you so much. In fact, SFMTA warning of major delays, uh, both by bus and by car, for several more hours to come. And that neighborhood impacted as this process is underway, as the fire crews make sure that all of the hot spots are out. They did uh, evacuate some people. They had other people stay in place. So clearly, there is disruption there. And look, there look the are, are still, still flames to be dealt with there. By the way, our reporter, Lauren Anthony, out there has just spoken with a student uh, of US, USF who lives above that Chinese restaurant that was engulfed in flames. Uh, she's safe, but she is worried about losing important documents, including her visa. Uh, she has a whole interview with Laura, which is going to be coming up because we'll be continuing our breaking news coverage, as you know, coming up with Amma and Larry. Right, exactly yeah. right. And her story is still underway, as you see those flames mm -hmm. still coming out from the top of the building there. That still has to be dealt with. All right. So thank you for joining us on ABC 7 News for the special breaking news coverage in San Francisco. And now we'll continue our breaking news coverage of the natural gas explosion and fire. Now from ABC7, live breaking news. That is so crazy. It is huge. A terrifying explosion and a fire in San Francisco's Jordan Park neighborhood. The gas just turned off about half an hour ago. Uh, PG&E is on scene trying to stop that gas leak, but uh, until such time, we're here. We've declared uh, evacuations and checked every building around the perimeter for a one block radius. There's nobody within the distance in a, in a one block radius. Uh, no injuries to report. Joanne Hayes White, the fire chief there, an amazing story. As she said, no injuries despite several people being on site when that explosion occurred. I want to give you a live look at the scene right now from Sky 7. You can see all that smoke, the natural gas explosion and the fire. It originally started at 1.18 p.m., and we've been bringing you live team coverage for about two and a half hours now. A construction crew was working at Geary Boulevard and Parker Avenue. They apparently hit the gas main, and this is the result. And now you've got to deal with some water damage as well as fire damage to five buildings in that area. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us as we continue our live coverage. I'm Larry Beale. And I'm Ama Dates, and we saw those flames until about 20 minutes ago. We have live team coverage on the fire explosion and what's happening with people living and working in that neighborhood. Let's begin with ABC 7 News reporter Vic Lee. Vic. Well, what you are watching now, what you are seeing now is good news. The uh, PG&E was able to shut off that gas leak 
uh, and uh, the flames disappeared immediately. The explosion and fire erupted shortly after one this afternoon. So it had burned for about two and a half hours before the gas was shut off and the flames disappeared. Now, San Francisco Fire says private contractors working on fiber optics accidentally hit a fire line, accidentally hit a gas line, setting off the explosion and fire. It went from a two alarm to a three alarm fire before it was put out. Now, Chief Hayes White says at the time, eight workers were in the area working on that uh, those fiber optics, but they were not injured. In fact, she says there were no injuries reported. A building on one side of the fire suffered the most damage, a building which housed uh, several businesses and residential units, including the popular restaurant, Hong Kong Lounge uh, Dim Sum Restaurant. And that restaurant, we are told, is badly damaged and perhaps destroyed. Now, Chief Joanne Hayes-White briefed reporters just a little while ago, as did a PG&E spokesman. Here's a little of what they said. There's a total of five buildings. The fire building itself, which is at the corner of Geary and Parker, plus four others at this point. And so they're mixed commercial and residential. We anticipate uh, some displacements. Uh, initial reports indicate that uh, this was a third party dig in um, related to a construction project and uh, not, not in any way associated with PG&E. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we're working diligently and safely and as quickly as possible to resolve the situation. And so PG&E was able to shut off the gas leak about a half an hour ago when they did, the flames disappeared uh, immediately after the gas was shut off. So we have good news to report. Now, the bad news, of course, is that there are evacuees, uh, evacuees who have been driven out of their units, businesses that were damaged. Uh, the Hong Kong lounge, as I said before, was badly damaged, perhaps destroyed. Uh, we will have more uh, to report on that later on uh, as we get mo more details uh, now that the fire is out. But we are told that some businesses have uh, have offered to take some of the evacuees in. Uh, we're told Mel's Diners, which is just down the road here on Geary, is one of those businesses that is welcoming evacuees to have a cup of coffee, a meal, just sit in their restaurant until uh, they can uh, they can decide where to go, essentially. So that's the very latest here at the fire scene at Geary and Parker. Back to you. Yeah, and possibly St. Mary's Cathedral a little later on. That was thrown around as a possible location as well. Vic, from where you mm -hmm. are standing, were you feeling the heat from those flames? What was that like? Well, we were actually one block away down on Geary when we first got here. Uh, and that fire, as I said, was shooting flames 30, 40 feet into the air. What we could feel was it was like it was raining. It was like a storm of water over the entire area because the firefighters were spraying the adjacent buildings and they were trying to keep the area as cool as possible. So it was raining water on us and you could feel some of the heat as you approached closer to the flames. Again, we were about a block away when we first came here. So it was a combination of, of, of heat when you got closer but more like rain from the uh, water that firefighters were pouring onto the buildings. Hey, Vic, one last question for you. Do we have any idea of what the numbers uh, would be for the residents affected in that area? I know there's about 3,000 people without power because that was cut off, but how many residents are in that vicinity that would be affected? Well, we did ask Chief Joanne Hayes White that question. She said she did not know it was too early, but she did say that uh, firefighters went from building to building, those five buildings that were impacted, uh, to look for people to see if there were any, uh, if there was anybody in those buildings that needed to be rescued. Uh, but everybody was accounted for, she said. Uh, she said among the evacuees, perhaps, perhaps 50, perhaps 100, but she really did not not know at that time. Yeah, she said she hoped fewer than 100, so we do hope that that number does stay low of displaced yeah. people. Vic, thank you so much. He was talking about those flames and how high they were shooting up. This, These were pictures and video from just a few hours ago of the fire. You can see how intense. I mean, there's, it's just like they're exploding out of the ground there. Oh, this was raging out of control for a couple of hours before they could actually squeeze off the gas line, and, and we were wondering 
Well, it's not just like a valve like you would right. in your kitchen, your kitchen where you just turn the valve or your valve outside your house. It's much more complicated than that, and that's why it took a while to get that fire put out because they couldn't get to the source and stop the gas from feeding in. Let's get to ABC7 News reporter Laura Anthony. We talked to some witnesses right near the explosion. Laura? Hi, Larry. Well, I'm actually at Geary Boulevard and Cook. We're just to the east of where the fire and the explosion was. Let's show you what it looks like right now. A much better scene uh, than what we were able to show you earlier today. Uh, that uh, flame, that huge flame that we've been looking at for the better part of two and a half hours went out, as Vic said, uh, in, a, in a second, as soon as they apparently turned this gas off. Let's show you what it looked like from sky. Uh, shooting from the ground, really, from a hole in the ground, uh, was shooting uh, three, four stories into the air and then igniting the building next door. Uh, we did talk with one young man, a witness, who was in the area and had walked by the area just seconds before he told us he heard a muffled boom. I heard like a, like a small explosion, like something behind me. And I looked up and I saw people in front of me and they just started screaming and yelling. And I turned around at that point, and I saw flames kind of growing toward me. I actually thought it was it was a bomb for a second because it was just it was kind of erupting. And so I just took off running down the street. Uh, and then when I got to the end of the block, there were a lot of people standing and watching. So at that point, I turned around and just saw that it was this big fire. Uh, and it had just erupted at that point. Now, that uh, young man, Michael Comstock, told us he was quite concerned. He had seen a grandmother uh, with a small child walking by uh, just seconds before this explosion and fire. But as we heard from the fire chief, uh, as far as they know, everyone escaped unhurt. Uh, we did talk with several of the folks who were evacuated from the building, uh, specifically the residences, the apartments above the uh, Chinese restaurant. Uh, we talked with one young woman who told us she's a doctoral student at USF. She's a foreign student. She's here from Iran and she was in tears. Uh, she said because she, all she was able to do once she heard the explosion was grab her laptop, which has a lot of her work from school on it. But she said there are a lot of documents, including her visa in her apartment. And uh, she had no idea at what point or the point we were talking with her uh, as to whether all of that would be safe or whether she would have an apartment to go back to. We will well, um, we will certainly hear from her uh, in a little bit later in the newscast. I was also able, Larry and Alma, to talk a little bit more with a pg e spokesperson out here who gave us an idea of at least what the protocol is. And he said that they were able to confirm, pg e was able to confirm, that they did have someone come out and mark this area, mark the streets, uh, so that this third party could come in, this construction company, and do their work and know where the gas lines were. Um, as as to what happened today that set off this fire and explosion. Of course, that will be part of a larger investigation. Live in San Francisco, Laura Anthony, ABC 7 News. And Laura, you were talking to the people in that area who were just barely able to get out. You know, she grabbed a laptop. That was all she was able to get. Does it sound like they are getting the information they need on where to go to reunite? I mean, we've been told through the news conferences that we're putting out to everybody, but are they getting the information on where to go to get help? Well, at the point at which I spoke with her and some other folks, uh, they weren't really sure. They were mostly just trying to stay back like we were from the fire itself. Um, they seemed like they had some decent information about where they should be in the short term. And then in terms of where they're now or what sorts of information they're getting now, I'm, I'm just not sure about that. All right. Hopefully they're, you know, hopefully they have a phone or something, can get the social media and know where to go. Mel's is one place they can go to get snacks, water, and of course the Red Cross is always going to pitch in to help too. Yeah, I wonder how many of us, when you see something like this, you wonder how many of us are really prepared. If, if something happened in your house and you had to just grab your, whatever belongings, right. would you have the presence of mind? How many people are really prepared right. for some sort of a disaster in their own home, their own apartment? Uh, and you I hope they are because we talk about the earthquakes all the time. I know we have our no. earthquake, we have our emergency kit, and I know that's the first thing I should grab, but when you're in that moment and there are just flames, I mean, you just run, unlikely. You just get out. I know. I, I hope this just serves as another example for people that you got to think about this stuff, yeah, yeah. even though we tend to just go on with our daily lives.
But uh, thankfully, no injuries. That's the most important thing. Yeah, and absolutely. if if we'll show more video because we've been showing it all day long, there are some workers there, uh, PG and and fire crews, just courageous. I mean, they were right across the street from the flames that were just out of control and uh, doing all they could to turn off the gas line. And to think of those workers escaped too. No injuries that we've right. been told at this point. It is incredible. That gas explosion, it happened right in front of the Hong Kong Lounge 2. It's a restaurant. It's on the corner of Geary Boulevard and Parker Avenue. That's on the edge, the very edge of the city's Jordan Park neighborhood, which is close to the inner Richmond. ABC 7 News anchor Eric Thomas is live in that neighborhood right now and joins us. Eric? Yeah, guys, as you mentioned, it's fortunate there were no physical injuries, injuries to the psyche. Well, we don't know yet, but there were a lot of scared and nervous people around here. If you went to any intersection where you could see the flames shooting up into the air, well, there are a lot of observers. You see some of them still here. Some were evacuated from that one block area around the fire that we showed you earlier. And as Vic showed you, well, the status of it right now, well... There's uh, no fire shooting up in the air. The, the smoke has blown away. Let me tell you, when we got here uh, about two hours ago, there was a column of flame shooting up, and it was rather scary. Now, let's show you what we saw earlier from Anza and Parker. Yeah, you could hear it. And you could see it from where we were. You couldn't feel the heat, but it looked pretty impressive. Now, as we told you, one block area was evacuated. The uh, evacuations uh, went to a lot of different places. Mel's Diner is one place we were told. And if you went further back, well, that's where the traffic was stopped off. We talked to some people who had to leave and just grab a few things and some people who got the word while they were at work. It's pretty terrifying to see it in action and see the, see the fire licking, licking your neighborhood. Uh, but, you know, the, the reality is, is that it seems like our first responders are here keeping the area safe. I called my dad and I was like, I don't know what's going on. And then, like, some man came to my door and told me I had to get out. So I grabbed my dog and I just kind of grabbed some shoes and ran out of the house. Yeah, that's uh, young Emmy Sobel you just heard from there. And there were some of the people you saw standing around waiting for the uh, OK to go back in, which still has not been sent yet. The latest word we have from Nixle is uh, they're still not OK to go back into that one block area. And uh, it will come back to me live out here at Euclid and Parker and show you that's Emmy and her dad over there. Emmy's wearing a blanket because that's uh, what her dad had in the car. And she just grabbed what she could and she got out. And they're both standing there right now. So we will bring you uh, more information from the folks here about when they get to go back in and just what the uh, terror was like when we uh, see you again. As right now at Euclid and Parker, Eric Thomas, ABC 7 News. Yeah, Eric, is there any indication on how long it will be before people are allowed to get back into their residence? I know uh, Geary and Parker, that is where the, the fire broke out, so I assume uh, they've got a circle here and they'll keep, they'll kind of condense the perimeter as there's no threat at this point that's imminent. Yeah, uh, no threat that we know of that's imminent. But as you know, when it comes to public safety, those officials down there are not letting anybody in so they can guarantee folks safety. And you see trucks uh, from the San Francisco Fire Department and PG&E out there right now. It took a while, a couple of hours at least, to shut off those pipes and quit feeding that fire. So uh, we will tell you as soon as we know when folks are let back in. Right now, the only way to get back into that area is if you are wearing a fire or police or PG&E uniform. Okay. All right, Eric Thomas, thank you so much. He is at Euclid and Parker. Now, here's what we do know. The fire chief says that a company laying down fiber optic lines actually hit that gas line. ABC 7 News has learned that a permit was issued to MCI Metro Verizon. Mastec was actually the construction crew involved. We called Mastec. They hung up. We are working to find out more about this company. And we used the ABC 7 News app to send out a push alert while the fire was burning this afternoon. You can download the app to be the first to know when news breaks, and you can customize those alerts uh, to your specific neighborhood so you, you know the news yeah. where you live. It really comes in handy, especially yeah. on days like today. Well, we are continuing to monitor what's happening with this gas explosion, including the latest on PG&E and what it took to finally get that gas shut off. Now, yeah, stay with us. As we continue our coverage of the gas explosion and fire in San Francisco's Jordan Park neighborhood, we'll be right back.